Okay, um, so it's my pleasure now to welcome my colleague, um, Dr. Don Mordecai. Um, Don, uh, a few years ago, uh, was asked to add to his set of responsibilities at Kaiser Permanente, where he was uh, the leader for psychiatry for Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, to take on the role of um, leading the transformation of mental health and wellness throughout Kaiser Permanente nationally. Um, he's been with Kaiser Permanente since 2003. Um, gee, Don, this is, all, this is new stuff for me that I'm, that I'm learning here. Um, he trained at Stanford University um, uh, at the School of Medicine in child and adolescent as well as adult psychiatry. So he's got the entire span covered in terms of no matter who you are, Don's your guy. Um, also worked uh, patients with developmental disorders, ADHD, and the entire range of general psychiatry issues. Um, particularly interested in working with, with um, adolescents and young adults. And of course, in his free time, he continues to teach as an adjunct professor um, of psychiatry at Stanford's uh, School of Medicine. So Don's gonna lead us through um, our next panel, and I think make a few other remarks about what's going on at Kaiser Permanente. Yep. Don, thank you. Tony, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, you feel a little far away, so I, I may try to be like bigger up here, but um, so uh, I wanted to thank Tony as, as our uh, government relations host from Kaiser Permanente. I wanted to thank the Center for Total Health the whole government relations team, and mostly I want to thank all of you who are here on this day to talk about a topic that uh, is obviously near and dear to my heart, um, but has really become uh, very important to Kaiser Permanente as a whole. Uh, we really see mental health and wellness as uh, a central part of our strategy going forward. We like to talk about total health, mind, body, and spirit, and this is really our efforts around the mind, and I would I would say around the spirit um, as well. Um, Kaiser Permanente, for those of you who don't know, we're the largest private integrated um, com uh, insurance healthcare company in the country. We have about 11.8 million members. If I wander, is that okay? I'm looking at the AV people. Like, can I? Yep. Oh, cool. <laughs> I feel much better. <laughs> um, so uh, conservatively, conservatively we, we do about 4 million plus uh, mental health and addiction care visits a year. So we're a very large provider as well as an insurer uh, that's integrated with our care system for primary care, specialty care, all of that. Um, we, think it's a, we, we think it's a pretty great model and a great way to do both mental health care and all care. Um, we are leading a process to do some important things within mental health. Uh, we see that uh, we need to focus both within the specialty care system but also within the primary care system as well to do integration the way that we can. In terms of specialty care, we're looking at a few things. One is access, right? We believe that access is simply fundamental to getting mental health care right. And in some ways, it is starting to feel like a social justice issue to some extent because, you know, there's national mental health care parity, uh, the ACA is still in effect, and yet if you can't find a mental health provider, uh, if you can't find a child psychiatrist or a child therapist, there's no access, there's, there's no parity there. Um, so we take access extremely seriously. Uh, the second thing we're doing is around what we call feedback-informed care, which is to bring measurement-based care into mental health, because we know now that there are ways to measure improvement and what works and what doesn't work in mental health care, and yet mental health care has been lagging as a, as a branch of medical care for a long time in terms of using those kind of measurement-based approaches. So we like to talk about it as, as if you were measuring blood pressure, right? People can come in for a check. We can do patient-reported outcomes to assess how they're doing. We can use those outcomes with an individual to track progress over time and say, hey, things are getting better, that's great. What are you doing that's working? Um, or things aren't getting better, right? Your blood pressure is not getting under control. We need to change what we're doing. Uh, and then, of course, we can aggregate all that information to say, well, how as a system can we get better? What can we do as a system to take better care of our members? Uh, it has helped us learn things like, 
which kinds of visits are most important to people getting better with an episode of major depression? Is it, is it individual therapy visits? Is it group therapy visits? Is it medication management visits? What combination of those visits provides the best outcomes for people? So we're very excited about that. We think that's the way that the whole country's system of mental health care should, should go so that we can demonstrate the worth of this very important uh, care that we're providing. And the last thing that we're working on is around suicide prevention. We feel like that is a, a, a sort of top-line issue that um, all care systems need to be paying attention to. We know that the suicide rate after dipping for many years is now on the rise again, that suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people after accidents, and that's just not the way it should be in our society. And we think we can change that. We're doing some exciting predictive analytics work on that. Uh, that I would love to tell you more about at length, but I will not do that right now. Um, but I may have a chance later if you want to hear more about that. Um, in terms of primary care, we have a project around uh, depression care management where we're trying to really bring impact-like efforts into primary care because uh, we know that we can take care of a lot of these things further upstream and get people better earlier such that they might not even need to go into specialty mental health care. There's proven models for that, and we feel like if Kaiser Permanente can't do it, nobody can do it. So we're really pushing on that uh, throughout our program. So uh, with that, I mean, you heard a lot from, from Pete. I really appreciated what he had to say. If you don't leave that feeling disturbed, maybe hopeful too, but disturbed about the way we're dealing with mental health care in our country, um, that, that was striking to me. We, of course, see similar issues. Um, we have workforce issues. We know that there aren't enough people to provide mental health care throughout our country. We have fragmentation issues. So even where people are covered, um, e even in our integrated system, some of the, the people we take care of who are Medicaid funded, um, they can get mental health care in our system, but addiction care, they have to go back to the counties, right? doesn't make a lot of sense to us in our integrated system, and a lot of times we see that the counties don't really have the resources to provide that care, so then it really doesn't make sense. Um, and then, of course, there are the resource issues. Uh, as, as Pete said, I think we're simply not spending enough money in the right places to take care of people. I, it's like as if all of you don't know that, but um, I think it bears saying. So um, what I've been asked to do today is to sort of build upon Pete's introduction to continue this theme of how, are we, how do we give voice to both uh, people, consumers, patients, however you want to call them, who are dealing with mental health issues themselves and their family members. And um, I'm thrilled I'll be introducing the panel in a little bit. But along with this theme of giving people voice, Kaiser Permanente has invested uh, quite a bit over the past couple of years in an uh, effort we call Find Your Words. And this is a public health awareness campaign around defeating stigma around mental health issues. I wonder how many people saw the Find Your Words ad um, with the, the young African-American boy walking through the streets of Los Angeles. Raise your hands. So a fair number. We actually showed it throughout the country. It's not meant to be a Kaiser Permanente ad, so we didn't just show it in Kaiser Permanente markets. Um, we, we do happen to be in Atlanta, but it was on during the Super Bowl uh, in the Atlanta market, which I just think is so cool, like an ad about mental health stigma to on during the Super Bowl. Um, so we're continuing that effort. Uh, this year we have a, a new public health awareness campaign ad that I'm going to show in just a moment. Um, we've done a uh, large uh, demographically diverse poll looking at mental health attitudes in the United States. Uh, just a few interesting things about that. About 70% of people feel like attitudes about mental health and being open about mental health uh, are getting better. About the same amount of people feel like, you know what, I'm ready to do my part. I want to help people who I think may be struggling with these things. Um, on the negative side, more than half of people felt like depression is at least in part due to personal weakness or failing, um, which to me is that old stigma-laden, we got to move past that attitude because that's the kind of attitude that makes people say, okay, there's something wrong with me. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to raise my hand and get care for it. I'm not going to get better. Um, we, we can do a lot better than that in our society. So with that, let me, uh, let me show the Find Your Words spot. It's about a 30-second spot. And uh, can we get that up there? Excellent.
So just 30 seconds, no faces, no words, um, but I think really sets a kind of tension about, oh, what's happening with this person? Oh, what's this person going to say? And then, of course, it leaves you hanging. Um, one thing we saw in our poll is that people don't really know what to say to start those conversations. So we put up this ad. If you go to findyourwords.org, which I would encourage you to do, there's lots of great resources about how do you start that conversation, right? Uh, how do you seek care if you're an individual struggling? How do you communicate uh, with uh, your loved ones that you think may be struggling? Um, we make connections to our partner organizations, NAMI, Mental Health America, the Crisis Text Line, the Suicide Prevention Hotline, and it's it's wide open to anybody who, who goes to the website. So we're, we're pleased with that. And then uh, on the website, we also have uh, StoryCorps. How many people have heard of StoryCorps? We're in DC, so I figure there are a lot of NPR listeners here. So StoryCorps is a project to try and gather America's stories, if you will. And we ask them to, to gather stories about um, people interacting with each other who have mental health conditions. And what we wanted to do is show you uh, one of these stories. This is available on the website. Um, a couple pitches for the website. It's, it's mobile enabled, so it looks beautiful on your phones. And it also is uh, in Spanish. And uh, Pete earlier was talking about the importance of resources in other languages. Uh, so if we could show the, uh, the Al Smith video. As a kid, I had this feeling inside that I, I never really could put a label on. And one of my first years of college, I was in an English class, and existentialism came up. The teacher was describing it. I felt like she was describing how I feel. And I never knew there's a word for this, and other people think this too. There's this one quote by Kierkegaard, I think, and... Basically, it said, I went to the party and I was the life of the party and I made everyone laugh and smile and I toasted and talked and then I went home and I wanted to shoot myself. And that was it right there. This is like before Facebook. I think it was on MySpace for my little quote about myself. I said, I love life. I'm soaking it up. I can't learn enough. It's so exciting. And then I can sink into a black hole of despair. Not like I want to kill myself, but I don't want to exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You're just questioning, what's it all worth? Yeah. It's like hard to get out of bed. And I had a panic anxiety disorder where I, I had trouble breathing. Your heart just starts pounding, pounding, pounding. I felt like I was having a heart attack. So I went to a breathing therapist. And then I tried yoga. I tried acupuncture. And I still was so depressed. And I was just like, I need something. I'm going to get on meds. When everybody asks, how did we meet, I jokingly say I stalked her, but I certainly don't want to endorse that kind of behavior. But I heard your punk rock all-girl band and finally got the guts to say hi to you. And you asked me to play drums on your zombie band project. So that's kind of where it started. We fell in love by our love of music. Meeting you and when we started dating was refreshing because when you found out I was on medication for depression... Your reaction to that was nice because you told me you were also on medication for ADD. Mm -hmm. And I've never felt pressure from you to get off my medicine or never felt like you judged me for being on meds. And that's just been really nice because in past relationships, I've had people try to say like, oh, well, we'll get you off that, you know, or something like they didn't really understand me. I've never really judged anyone for anything that they did, didn't do, or medication they were on, you know, because it's, it's obviously by no fault of their own. So it's hard to fault somebody for trying to help themselves. So I'm glad that you weren't feeling judged by me. You also went to therapy for a while, as I did, and I think both of us realized that therapy can be a really good thing for people who are struggling. Mm -hmm. I can think of one therapist that literally saved my life. I don't even know if I would be here if it weren't for her. So now you can enjoy your day on a even keel? How does that feel? I find a joy in the little things in life, and I just try to be thankful for what I have. There's so many good things you can read and awesome bulletin boards and things. Mm -hmm. People just talking about how they feel. And it is calming to know that you're not alone. You are not alone. And just remember that.
So th those are our public facing efforts around raising mental health awareness and trying to break through the silence and the stigma that we feel like is really holding people back in terms of getting care. Uh, we're on a journey in Kaiser Permanente to be the nation's best mental health and wellness uh, and addiction care program in the country. Part of that journey very explicitly is to be, is to put the, the voice of the patient, the member, the consumer at the center of what we do. And with that, I want to lead us into a discussion about that with uh, two guests that I'm really thrilled to introduce to you. Uh, Karis Merrick is the Director of the Office of Consumer Affairs for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. She holds a master's degree in organizational psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology of Alliant International University and a master's degree in business administration from Case Western Reserve University. Karis, do you want to come out and join us? Karis, you are sitting second chair, right behind me. Uh, and then Mary Giliberti is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. You heard Pete Early talking about NAMI earlier. Uh, prior to joining NAMI, she served as a Section Chief in the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard College and a law degree from Yale Law School. So, welcome, both of you. you. And I'm going to... I'm going to switch our cards, Mary. Oh, okay. But thank you. I, I wanted to sit over there anyway. <laughs> so, um, I just want to open up by giving you two a chance to talk a little bit about yourselves and your organizations. I don't, I'm going to sit like this so I can see you both. Um, so, tell us some of your story. Tell us about the organization that you're with now and its role, and why is it important to do what we're doing today? Karis, do you want to start? Um, so I'll, I'll start, but um, I want to sort of start in a different way because I'm introduced in my organizational role, um, and I'm not here representing my organization per se. Um, you'll hear from our new Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, um, Dr. McCann's Katz, later on this afternoon, so I do not want to steal her thunder. Um, so I want her to have all the thunder, and, <laughs> we'll and I'll take some lightning. I don't know what I'll take. But anyway, so um, what, what I prefer to do is just introduce um, myself to you as um, just as an individual, like, like who am I as a, a person? And I, I had some slides. I don't, I don't know if they're there, but I'm a very visual person, so this helps me sort of uh, keep on track. We do have your slides if okay. you want them. So as you see... I just said what I said there, so I am on track without the slides, but now you see it. Um, all right, so um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so, yeah, that is cute as pie, is it not? <laughs> Everybody has to go, aw, all right. Aww. Okay, participate, it's all good. So anyway, that's me, and um, I'm, um, you know, before anybody knew anything about me, I'm, I'm a little girl. Um, I'm clearly, I have a brother, so I'm a sister. Um, I guess he's a loving brother. However, he may be sucking the life right out of me at that moment. <laughs> I do not know. Um, I am uh, clearly African American. I'm a person of color. I'm also Muscogee uh, Creek Indian. Um, the picture was taken on a tabletop in Bremerhaven, Germany, which is where I was born. So I'm an army brat, or known as a global nomad. Um, and later on in life, um, well, and I, my family is huge, and that's why I kind of love this picture, because it contextualizes everything about me that I bring to the table that's important to me, whether it be in my work role or whether it be in my quote-unquote patient role. So I am a person with lived experience of a mental illness, and I have a, a diagnosis of a schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, depending upon who you ask and what day you ask them. And... Um, I think those are some of the things that will really ground some of my um, discussion um, here with you today. Hello, everybody. I'm Mary Giliberti. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of NAMI. Um, and I guess I thought I would tell you a little bit about the early part of my story because it's kind of relevant to why I think it's so important to talk about mental health and mental illness. So um, when I went to college, I didn't know anything about mental illness. It hadn't, um, I hadn't had any experience with it, know anything about it, and I met a dear friend who became one of my sweet mates who had major depression. And I basically said and did everything NAMI tells you not to do. You can look it up on our website. I did them all. <laughs> Cheer up. 
look on the bright side, look where we are, you know, everybody loves you, all these things that only served to let her know that I didn't have a clue what she was going through. Um, and so, you know, I let her feel alone. And um, during my last year of college, she attempted suicide. Um, we graduated. She was supposed to come and visit me, and she canceled. And then she died by suicide. And for me, this issue is really important because it's so personal and important to be that support for somebody, and also because it taught me the really hard way that these illnesses are lethal. And I think we forget that sometimes, that people think of these things as things you can will your way out of or not that serious, and yet they are very serious. And, and we can make a tremendous difference if we get in early because 75% of these conditions onset before age 24. So we can make an enormous difference. And that's what at NAMI we really try to do. So we have, I would say, three basic beliefs. One is you are not alone. Right? That, is, that is core to who we are and what we do. So we say to families, to people with mental illness, you are not alone. And we teach everybody else how to make sure they don't feel alone as well. We also believe that knowledge is power. So we spend a lot of our time empowering people by teaching them. We teach them about the conditions. We teach them about the various kinds of treatment. And we help people um, help themselves. We talk a lot about how we help people build better lives. We don't build it for them. And then finally, I would say we fight injustice. Because at the core, we believe that what happens to people with these conditions is fundamentally unjust and wrong. And I, you heard it this morning. I mean, there are no other conditions that I can think of where you wind up in jail because you are so ill. There are no other conditions that I can think of where the shortages are as critical as they are in our field. I recently had the privilege of being at a child psychiatry uh, reception. And I, I, somebody said to me, you know, you, you look um, kind of overwhelmed. And I said, I can't believe there are, like, child psychologists, I, I spend, psychiatrists. I spend so much time trying to find them. I felt like I was in a room of unicorns. <laughs> and that's just fundamentally unjust. Um, and as the CEO of NAMI, I take calls all the time from families and individuals, all the time. The first thing I ask them is, what's the issue? The second thing I ask them is, do you need it covered by insurance? American Heart Association is not asking that question. American Diabetes Association is not asking that question. And someday, I don't want to be asking that question. Yeah. And I, I, I just want to add about the workforce issue. You know, when I, I um, so I'll just say in my role in the Office of Consumer Affairs at, at SAMHSA, the role is to represent the um, lived experience, the consumer voice, as well as the adult family voice, because we do have a child and adolescent family branch that represents parents of uh, transitional age youth and youth and children. But um, as a person with lived experience, when I moved here um, four years ago from Los Angeles to the D.C. area to take the job, I had to find a new psychiatrist. And I'll tell you, there are plenty out there. But as soon as they heard my diagnosis, there aren't plenty out there. Hmm. So um, as I think Pete was saying, you know, and, and here it is, you know, 2017, going into 2018, my psychiatrist is still in California because it's very, very difficult to um, go. And, and they'll say, come see me. And I stopped going to see them. And I had to ask them first, do you work with people with schizophrenia? And the answer is no. So access is one thing, building a workforce is another thing, ensuring we're asking the right question about what, what uh, skill sets and uh, the folks that people are willing um, and trained to work with is, um, I think, another deeper uh, question. It just can't be add more psychiatrists. I, I think that's going to be really a critical thing. Absolutely. I mean, having them actually treat people who have the most serious conditions. And then just trying to find out who has the... Um, evidence-based practice that you might be looking for, for whatever condition it is that you have, is another whole um, area. I mean, I think about it, I know more about the food I eat because they make them put it on the boxes than I do when I was looking for a therapist for someone in my family. She wanted to see someone trained in CBT, and it was really hard hmm. to figure out if they really had the training or they just had some, you know, weekend thing or whatever it was. Um, for schizophrenia, it's incredibly hard to find people who are trained to do that kind of therapy 
for people with schizophrenia. I mean, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. And to me, there ought to be more transparency and knowledge for people seeking help as to what they're getting when they actually get the help. Is it what we know works? Um, right now, we don't have that. Yeah. And, and Karis, I know you, you didn't want to take the Assistant Secretary's thunder, but, no, no thunder. but are, no thunder. is it okay to talk about your, your, your role within SAMHSA? Because I wasn't aware that there was an Office of Consumer Affairs, and so sure. I'm sort of wondering, how do you represent the voice of people with lived experience, sure. of family, of individuals, to the federal government? I mean, yeah. how, how does okay. that work? Sure. So um, in my um, role as the director of the office, and the office has been in existence for, uh, I think Paolo will kill me because I don't know, but um, what, 20 years? A while. 20, 20 years, something like that. Um, and um, I'm the second director of that office. And uh, basically what we do is, um, it is not my voice that represents the whole nation. Um, what we do is we do sort of stakeholder involvement. So we have uh, lots of different mechanisms of hosting meetings, expert panels, dialogues, where we bring in people with a variety of experiences and touches with the mental health system or housing or criminal justice or employment. Um, and we will have uh, topical dialogue similar to what kind of what we're doing now, but it'd be more dialogue-y out there, mm. um, you know, some presentation and then people dialoguing. And then we take that information and um, use that information sometimes to do white papers, sometimes to develop what is the plan of action or strategy that we might use for uh, within our strategic plan. Um, it might be about um, materials development, things like that. And, and then we um, don't do that just at the Center for Mental Health Services or at SAMHSA. We also do it with our federal partners. It could be with um, uh, HUD. It could be with NIMH. It could be NIH. It could be, um, you know, a CMS. So we, we do partner with um, a lot of uh, other federal agencies um, and also um, like NAMI, um, MHA, NADAC. Uh, so also in the um, substance abuse world, we, uh, or substance use world, we also do partnerships, recognizing that there is co-occurring, and there is a um, Office of Consumer Affairs in the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment as well, and we partner with them. Okay. I mean, I find that very encouraging, that our federal government would want to set something like that up. Our, <laughs> tough question. Are people listening? Well, so, so, you know, I will be clear about something. You know, working for the federal government is um, filling out forms to get the job that are very intense, and there is a box on the form where you have to disclose if you have a mental health disorder. Um, and I was forewarned about that and um, knew that um, I would have to be um, honest. You pay a huge fine if you're lying. Um, and I was worried about whether that would impact my ability to get the job especially when I had my uh, clearance interview with the, uh, <laughs> with the background person, and she said, so tell me about this. You check yes on the, on the uh, mental health. And it's a long questionnaire, I tell you. It's, I don't know how many questions, but it takes about three days to fill out. And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I do. And, and she said, so what's the diagnosis? And I said, oh, Lordy may, here we go. And so I said, it's uh, schizophrenia. And she went, what? And I'm thinking, you know what? That is so not the right answer. Wow. It is not the right response. <laughs> not exactly. It's not what I'm looking for. Um, so I had to do a little education with her. And um, uh, really it led to, there was already an executive order in place looking at question 21 um, because there was um, um, interest in whether or not there was this intersection between, of course, violence and mental illness and how can we protect our government employees Mm -hmm. And I got to serve on the um, uh, a group working with that executive order so that they could have a better understanding of, um, okay, you have to ask the question. The question's not going away. Um, my thing is, how do you ask the question? How does the person engage and understand the answer to that question? Um, what does it have to do with violence in the, in the first place? What are you really looking for? And what they were really looking for was behaviors of concern that they'll find regardless of if you have a mental illness. Hmm. So we really help separate that out and then to couch the question in such a way that it won't prevent people from seeking treatment prevent people from applying for positions, but really um, say that you know, we just want you to be open and honest, and um, we do encourage people to seek treatment, and we do know people can work and sustain jobs in the federal government and have a mental health condition. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work like that, too. Yeah. 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 I mean, this, this is a large area of stigma in our country, these sort of employment questions. Um, there's a whole issue around for physicians licensing questions that are different state to state. 
Um, and you know, a similar question, have you ever had a mental health condition? Well, you know, depression or anxiety, these incredibly common conditions, and people are faced with the idea of, oh, well, if I answer this in the affirmative, I, I may put my license in jeopardy. That's stigma, right? Because it's not asking, is there anything that could prevent you from doing your job? It's asking you, you know, do, do you have depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, whatever it might be. Um, Mary, I, I, people know NAMI. Right, it's very well known. Not as many people as I would like. Oh, really? Okay. On that. I was, was going to say you have a great brand. <laughs> it's on my list. Uh, you know, how is it, maybe for this audience, if it, not everybody knows, how does NAMI work to bring in the patient voice, the consumer voice, and the and the family voice? Um, because that's a central part of your mission. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think we do it through our advocacy. As Pete said, I serve on the interagency serious mental illness commission along with him. Um, we also do it through our education programs. So we have provider education programs, teacher education programs, and the point of those programs is to bring the lived experience to those providers and educators to take them through the eyes of the person living with um, the condition and their family. What does it mean? How are you treated? And I can give you an example. We did something with a hospital system where we showed how it felt for that individual when they came into the hospital and all these staff like sort of swarmed around them and started taking things and doing things. And, you know, you could really feel it when you were watching it. But for the hospital staff, that was like standard protocol. Like it wasn't a big deal to have all those people standing around trying to do their jobs. And we showed the impact it had on the person. And then we showed it if it had taken place a different way if just one or two people had tried to engage in a conversation first before you were grabbing their shoes off and you know, doing all these other things to them. And so we try to make it really uh, concrete on um, how uh, what happens in a provider setting influences the person and their family and can make a big difference as to whether someone stays in care um, and continues or really says, I want no part of this. Mm -hmm. um, so we spend a fair amount of our time working on that. We educate police. So Pete mentioned CIT training. Many, many NAMI members um, are very active in that training. They tell their stories, um, and that helps the police officers see things from a new lens. And I myself have been told by countless police officers how impactful that is for them. It makes a big difference. Um, and if we want to bring that number down of how many people with mental illness um, die or are injured in encounters with police, we're going to have to obviously add to the mental health service system and also continue that effort training police officers. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, family to family and peer to peer? Sure. Because when, when I'm working with patients who are, in, who are interacting with NAMI or family members, what they talk about is the sense of like, oh, I'm not alone anymore. Right. Like, I think the education is important, but, but for them it's... It's being part of a group that is working together to, to deal with this. Absolutely. So family to family and peer to peer are classes that are for families and people with lived experience. And they're multi-week classes. And it's exactly what you just said. People come and they share their stories. So class three and family to family, everybody shares their stories. And there's an incredible bonding that takes place. And it goes to that point of empowerment that I was talking about, because people feel empowered from the fact that they're learning a lot that they had no idea. I mean, many come in, and it's really quite shocking to me how little people actually know about their health conditions. And if you go to hospitals and see what people get upon discharge for other conditions versus mental health, it becomes more understandable. Um, but they know very little, and so we're teaching, so that's empowering. But then also, they're hearing from everybody around them. And they're learning that there's an organization that's actually out there to help fight these issues. So we also have a class about becoming an advocate Advocate. And that piece of empowerment where you go from this is something happening to me to this is something that I'm going to draw meaning from and do something with to change the system. Either I'm going to change it by being an educator or a presenter or I'm going to um, you know, fight stigma or do something else or at public policy. So I'm going to get activated. Um, and that's the next stage. So that's kind of how we look at it. Like we give you the, um, the building blocks and then we want to empower you to become one of those people fighting those social forces and fighting public policy. I mean, we took a thousand people to Capitol Hill this summer to say, you are not cutting hundreds of billions of dollars out of our Medicaid. It will hurt us. And look me in the eye and let me tell you why. You know, that's a big part of what NAMI does. And we had to get a thousand people to come to Washington mm -hmm. to want to do that. Um, and that's a big part of our job, 
is helping people see that they can make a difference with their voice, whether it's at the county level. I've gone with my NAMI to fight for more beds in Arlington, Virginia, or it's at the state level where you're fighting for the mental health uh, resources that seem to get cut all the time, or it's at the federal level where somehow somebody thought it was okay to take hundreds of billions of dollars out of the program that serves people with the greatest needs. And just to echo some of the things that Mary's saying, because it's so interesting we're sitting here together, um, I was introduced to NAMI um, as a part of my discharge from psychiatric hospitalization. And I was introduced to um, Karen Share, which for my affiliate back in California, Karen Share was a, a program for families to talk about, be sort of supportive to other family members. And of course, I walk in the room and they're like, Oh, so are you a family member? And I'm like, sure, I'm a family member. What? This is a ridiculous question. And, you know, just told you how important my family is. Yes, I'm a family member. And they're like, oh, okay, so um, who's the consumer? And I'm like, consumer of what? What do, you, what do you think? Like the whole, like all of a sudden you get introduced to all this new language. And um, I, I had to, t they finally said, well, who's the, who's the sick person in your family, dear? And I was like, oh, that'd be me. <laughs> and they were really thrilled to see me, not so much at the moment, but um, because that was their time and kind of in I walked. But um, as soon as they had heard that um, all of my family was all the way on the other side of the world, they enveloped me and embraced me. And you know, I, I affectionately call them um, my NAMI mommies because that's what they did. They mothered me and they um, really helped me and got me um, more connected, which is why, the reason why my um, a psychiatrist actually recommended that I go to NAMI, so much so that the next thing I know, like they just grab me and go, okay, you're gonna go take in our own voice and you're gonna go do peer-to-peer -peer, and you're gonna go sit on our board and eventually became um, uh, uh, the board president for the, for the national board and having to leave that to go to SAMHSA. Uh -huh. so. I just want to mention um, getting in early because that's another thing that um, NAMI's been working on and we were very fortunate to have um, Mrs. Gore support us to get in uh, the program called Ending the Silence into high schools. So we're going into high schools and doing presentations and the secret sauce of the presentations, and this won't surprise any of you, is a young adult who comes in and talks to the other uh, the students about mental illness. And the idea is to really early on try to change the stigma that's driving a lot of this public policy, try to encourage help-seeking behavior, and try to help people support a friend. Those are really the things that we're trying to do um, with those programs. So we're really trying to get in early. The, one of the few things we know about mental illness is that if you intervene early, you can make a tremendous difference. And the other thing we know is the power of personal story and having positive right. interactions with people who are living with mental illnesses. Um, it is evidence or, or in, re, in literature and in research um, shown to reduce um, all sorts of stigma, including social dis distancing. So a lot of times people will think, oh, if I just do the education and tell people about mental illness, what it's all about, that that will actually reduce, reduce stigma. And what it um, does is, yes, it might help people have a better understanding of what it is, but it actually increases social distancing. And then the isolation that we struggle with persists because people don't want to have anything to do with us, quite frankly. So again, sort of NAMI provides and other spaces provide um, opportunities for um, us to feel like we belong. But, but I'll be quite honest, I, I have, and this is Karis Myrick speaking, remember my slide disclaimer, um, is um, I, I struggle with things where um, I'm, I'm told um, uh, when I came into the mental um, health system, I was told I was a, a member, not a member of an insurance policy, I get that, but I was suddenly a member of this, this club that quite frankly, if I had to tick off a box, I would not have ticked off the box. So I didn't appreciate being called a member. Um, I understood why, because of people not having a sense of belonging. But um, it, it was really hard for me to kind of wrap my head around that. And um, I was telling Mary, and if somebody could go to my second slide, I was telling Mary this year that um, it's the first time I've had a, a really serious um, health condition. And um, when I uh, uh, came up, uh, found out that um, I uh, had lost my voice, basically, is what happened. And when I went to the emergency room, I had totally lost my voice, and uh, my whole neck was just sore. Everything was sore. And I had to go to the emergency room three times, and the third time, they finally said, well, look, we see that you're taking um, medication for a psychiatric disability. Are you sure it's not in your head? And I'm like, as much as I would love to sound like Lauren Bacall, no, it's not in my head. Um, and I'm going to sit here until you treat me. And eventually what they found out was that um, I had a massive uh, 
uh, lump on my, on my throat, which was really on my thyroid, if you could click next, on my thyroid, and um, I ended up having um, thyroid cancer and having to have my thyroid and parathyroid removed. And it was really striking, though, that 20 years ago I had been in the ER because of a car accident, and the same thing happened. So sometimes I think about policy, I think about people, I think about processes, and I think about the place. So the policy um, around, um, like, the um, um, electronic health record is probably okay as far as protections are concerned. I mean, I'm not going to go all into that, stealing thunder. <laughs> but how it got executed by the person, not so good. Mm. So they see that I'm taking a medication, and then suddenly up comes the discrimination. That is not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I show this slide because it's a reminder to me of what it feels like when you have schizophrenia and nobody sends you a dang get well card. Mm. And even if I don't believe I have a mental illness, which I didn't, I thought I had holes in my brain, just take a picture of it and you will see, which my doctor did. I don't know how he got that paid for, but I didn't have holes in my brain. But anyway, um, that's neither here nor there. So, <laughs> but the point of it is, is that if somebody had said, I'm thinking about you, um, I um, really care about you, I hope you stay in this world, or something like that, it would have been something, I got nothing. But when um, I uh, found out I had the thyroid issue, I got a buttload of cards. Oh, excuse my French. I got a lot of cards. <laughs> Is that French? <laughs> yeah, well, they, they speak it to you in the hospital. They ask, are you going to participate in the milieu? I'm like, what? You say I'm sick, but I'm supposed to participate in French? What? But anyway, so the whole system sometimes to me is really kind of interesting, and how we understand what's happening is really interesting. So I got all these get well cards, and then my um, endocrinologist starts asking me about depression and ending my life. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, here we go. And she said, no, no, that can happen when you have thyroid disease. And I'm like, mm -hmm. really? And um, I said, well, actually. And so I tell her a little bit, not, not terribly much. And I said, if I had said yes, would you have known what to do? And she said yes. And I said, oh, that's great. So first, she was trained well to ask. She was not afraid to ask about depression. She was not afraid to ask, would I end my life? Um, and um, secondarily on discharge, instead of getting huge discharge paperwork, I got a postcard that told me the five top things to do plus the big paperwork. Mm. It was amazing. So why don't we do that in mental health? Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, it's just a postcard. So I, I just want to point out, I'm going to uh, ask for questions from the audience soon. So we're going to keep talking a little bit, but, but please stand up. As Tony said, it is not acceptable to not have questions. So um, go ahead and get your questions ready. Mary, you want to say something? I just want to pick up on what Kara said about the difference between what's written and then what gets enacted. Mm -hmm. um, and we see this a lot in communications with families um, in the healthcare world. I mean, we hear it all the time that families feel like they're excluded, like the system is almost trying to separate out the mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. and the family member. And one of the reasons that I, NAMI really strongly supports early episode psychosis programs, there's many reasons, but one of them is that their default is that the family will be involved. Like that's, that's the norm, that's like what they expect to happen. Right. And they do everything they can to make that happen. And so their rates of family involvement are sky high, as are their rates of continued engagement in the 90 percentiles for some of these programs for 20-something-year-olds, um, which is really high. But the reason is because they orient the whole thing in that manner. Um, and they orient it toward recovery as well. They say, what do you want to do for a job, you know, relationship? We want to stay in school. They don't start with oh, you have this illness, and you need to take treatment, and you're going to be on this treatment forever, they start with, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And then they link that. And so it goes to Karis' point about so much of this is how are you approached? Is your, you know, are you approached as a person with dignity, with respect, with acknowledgement of the goals that you have, and you know, it's about you? Or are you approached with, this is the system, this is how we put you in this box, as she said, you're a member, you know, and this is what your path's going to be, says mm -hmm. we. Um, and you're going to do it over here, and your family's going to be over here because uh, we have this thing called HIPAA, so you don't have to share. So you don't want to write sign right here. Um, right. So, you know. <laughs> right. Don't make it complicated yes. for us by, yes. by sharing and having to bring in the family. I think he was... Question in the back, Winston. Uh, thank you. Um, Winston Wong from Kaiser Permanente. And, and thank you, Mary and Kiris, for uh, not only um, 
being champions for this work, but also sharing your personal stories. So, Kiris, you mentioned in your personal history about um, not finding a psychiatrist as you relocated for your condition. I was wondering if you could um, illuminate that a little bit more. Was it around the issue of uh, the amount of time that psychiatrists anticipated that they would have to uh, invest in your uh, therapy and your condition, or was it also a question of whether the compensation or the remuneration for the kinds of services that you might need became a barrier? Well, considering they didn't even want to talk to me, I can't really tell you. I mean, if I had to guess, and this would just be an educated guess, um, and um, it, it may be around their belief that there would have been a lot of time needed. I have a full-time job, so how much time are you going to spend with me? Not much, because i got to go to work. Um, so this, this idea that you're going to be spending an inordinate amount of time with me was kind of curious. Um, secondarily, um, uh, so it may be a preconceived sort of notion, um, it may be that they're really not trained to do so, and I don't want to work with somebody who's not trained to work with somebody with schizophrenia. That doesn't make any sense to me either, so I'm glad if they're saying no because they don't have the skill set to do so. Um, I didn't really press, press, the, press the issue because it became... Um, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, and, and I've never really used this word ever, but I was telling somebody the other day that I had this moment of realization that schizophrenia for me has been a thief, and it's stolen from me, and I'm pissed, and I'm um, angry, and I'm very, very sad about it. And some of the stuff I can't get back. And I might be able to sit up here and talk about it, and that might be great because I've had the experience, but there are things that have been stolen on the front end and as Pete said, our lives are ending earlier, so there are things that are trying to be stolen on the back end, and somebody wants to mess around with me and tell me they're not going to treat me, that's unacceptable. It's so unacceptable, I don't have words for it. And I shouldn't be a victim of a thief of an illness. I'm not a victim of a thief of them taking my thyroid. Um, they engaged my father. They asked me how do I want my father involved? Who's important to be involved with me in this whole process? They gave me two cards, one for a cancer support group, one for just a thyroid disease group, straight out the bat. Um, that didn't happen immediately um, for me in, in mental health care. And I don't understand why. If we're talking about parity, let's really talk about parity. This isn't parity. So um, sorry for my passion, but um, it, really, it really is... Something I'm still mourning, I think, when I hadn't realized that there's still some mourning for me around um, some things that I've lost that I will never get back. And um, also recognizing that I've gained a lot, too. And this has been um, a phenomenal experience, just kind of one I wish didn't happen the way it did, and hoping that it doesn't happen this way for other people. I hear Pete's story and his son, and I'm thinking, well, Dad, that's me, but I'm older. How is that possible? How is it possible that it's still happening? No apologies for passion. <laughs> We're the passion panel. Okay, the passion panel. We're the passion panel. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Nathaniel Counts, Mental Health America. So um, one sort of systemic way we're addressing this, right, is by consumer advisory groups at sort of all levels of the healthcare system. And we're doing a pretty good job, I think, in the sort of initial phases of putting consumer groups on boards and all sorts of things. Um, but unfortunately, last month, I think it was the American Journal of Public Health, they came out with a systematic review saying basically there's no evidence empirical evidence for the effectiveness of consumer advisory boards. Um, and meanwhile, you know, there's mountains of evidence for the rest of all of the value-based payment uh, structures happening. And so I was wondering what your thoughts are about sort of developing the science of patient engagement of every level um, so it doesn't become like a little hat we put on the top of uh, value-based payment. So, I mean, Nathaniel, I think part of it is the difference between being on an advisory board and being actually part of the solution. Um, you know, if I think about it, I could spend every minute of my day on an advisory board. I mean, we're asked, you, you're asked a lot, too. And, and so, you know, I think it's the difference between that and someone really wanting to know what the, patient, the journey is and wanting to look at the journey at every stage and meaningfully figure out if that journey is um, help working and helping that individual and family. And so I think that, you know, looking at advisory boards and what is the level of engagement? Is it, you know, you sit there 
or is it you're really driving what happens? And so I wonder if the study was done somehow, you know, parsing out the ones that are in name versus a more meaningful engagement of that journey, what we would find. Um, and that's what I would suggest because, you know, I tell people all the time I'm not interested in, you know, just being there to um, be window dressing. And, and I feel many times like I am asked for window dressing. I will just say that right out there um, because they want to be able to say they had me on the group rather than they plan to meaningfully make sure that the individual and family voice is engaged in what they are doing from, you know, and the issue too is are you there in the beginning or are you coming in later where they say, oh, bless this, you know, um, say this is okay, or give me comments on it, but it's all drafted, you know, so you can comment, but it's due, you know, so it's got to be commented on. So, I mean, there's just differences in level of engagement that I think are critical if you're going to research these things. Yeah, totally agree. In the back. Hi, my name's Kim Burton. I'm an uh, educator and an advocate on behalf of older adults and late life behavioral health issues. And I have a couple things. First, I want to just say after the first speaker, um, yeah, I lost my place. Oh, oh, that what we are seeing are increasingly uh, people with behavioral health disorders, not necessarily in jails, but in nursing homes, in assisted living, and long-term care settings, as we have people with serious mental illness living longer than they have before. These are our new, quote unquote, jails or places where we are, um, where people are landing. I wanted to ask about the use of mental health advance directives, and if you feel that mental health advance directives are a um, tool that we could be using to perhaps change um, treatment. And then the other thing I wanted to ask about, oh yeah, so in, in the older adult world, we have to put dementia under the umbrella of behavioral health, and I know today is about mental illness, but one of the things that we're looking at is the workforce and our psychiatric community and the people who do the work for mental illness are also doing the work for the behavioral in psychiatric symptoms of dementia. So I was wondering about how you feel about um, embracing other illnesses or other disorders that have psychiatric symptoms. I can't answer the matter. I mean, I, I can talk about um, Olmsted, and I know Mary, you, well, she's the queen of Olmsted, but um, um, just because we, we just recently um, had a meeting at um, um, SAMHSA uh, around Olmstead, which is uh, a state, um, I, well, you could talk about what it is at the federal level, but basically it is around um, uh, psychiatric uh, boarding in, in nursing homes and people not being able to live in the community of their choice um, and um, ensuring that states have what they need and follow their Olmstead ruling in order to um, uh, place people in community and not um, board them in, in nursing homes. So I think that's work that um, we continue to, to uh, do at SAMHSA. Uh, Dr. McCants Katz was not able to make that meeting. Um, we did have, again, federal partners um, aligned with us um, at, it was a very large meeting with um, HUD as well as uh, CMS and uh, SAMHSA and uh, um, other agencies. So um, it's, it's work that we continue to do and we do recognize that that's a, a huge problem. I mean, again, from a personal perspective, it's like I think I've touched every part of the system in every different way. You know, my mother had to yank me literally out of, of one of these situations and fight like a dog to get me out um, because it was the only um, option that was being offered to me uh, to be in a nursing home and I was young. I mean, and I was very young. And uh, the people that we were seeing in the nursing home were people on oxygen tank and all sorts of, and it was like, my mother was like, no, no, this, this is not gonna happen. So, but I'm fortunate to have parents who can do that. Not everybody has that. Um, and so we continue to work on that. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Olmstead is a Supreme Court ruling where the court said under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you had to be served in the most integrated setting appropriate to you. And uh, when I worked at the Office of Civil Rights, I did quite a bit of work under that uh, ruling. And as Kara said, um, it applies to people who are in nursing homes. So you will see some uh, litigation that has gone on. You'll see some policy agreements that have been made to try to move people from nursing homes into the community. But it's very scattershot where there's been complaints or where someone's investigated, where there's actually a will. 
Um, and I think in so many of the things we've talked about today, whether there's a will to change it um, is really important. And then the financing, as Pete said, that goes with that. With nursing homes, you can do things like waivers that allow you to serve people in the community. In these cases, I just think that the states have not done it, done what they could do to serve people in different settings. Um, in other instances, uh, you can't. The IMD exclusion, which is um, the Medicaid program, doesn't allow you to bill for uh, facilities that have over 16 beds. And the implication of that is that it is quite difficult to do a waiver from that uh, facility. So you know, there are reasons why structurally we see some of the things that we see. You asked about advanced directives. Um, we at NAMI are very supportive of them. You can find information on our website about them. I think they are a partial answer. They mm -hmm. contribute positively to helping people make decisions when they're in a difficult um, situation. They're not a perfect solution because there aren't any. Um, but they do contribute, and we certainly support that idea. And the last one about dementia, I would just say that we collaborate with organizations like the Alzheimer's Associations and others in a number of ways. We collaborate on our advocacy. We work very hard on research. We all need more research on the brain. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is the fact that in our field, there's been really very little breakthrough um, new therapies that you can see compared to like oncology and other areas where you're seeing things all the time. So we certainly collaborate a lot on pushing for more research to get us to uh, better solutions there. In terms of our own advocacy, I mean, I think that we feel like there are other organizations for whom that is their primary um, area. And so our primary area is uh, mental health conditions um, like some of the ones we've been talking about today. So I think we have time for one more quick question, if we can. Great. Thank you. Denise Solzbeck from the National Technical Assistance Network for Ch Children's Behavioral Health. My question is actually for both Pete and Mary. Can you talk a little bit about the timeline for ISMIC? I mean, 14 commissioners can't possibly come up with everything they need to by the report to Congress due in December. So what's the long-term process, and how can people contribute? Well, I think Dr. McCann's Katz is coming this afternoon, and you know she is, um, I think, extremely committed to the process. She um, has has indicated that you know this is really a, a tremendous priority for her, and she will be working on the timeline from here. Our initial report is due to Congress in December, right? December. That's an initial though, and then there is. A, quite a, a while before by statute we have a report due, but I think that we are all working and Dr. McCants Katz will ultimately decide how we will have interim um, markings to, to check on our progress as we move forward. So I would urge you to ask that question this afternoon, um, but those of us on, on the group are very grateful for the leadership that she's shown there. All right, so it we'll, sounds like we'll get more on that this afternoon. Um, can we get Karis's last slide up, please? Are you able to do that? Not that, well, that one's very interesting, but not that one. <laughs> and not that one. That one's very interesting, too, uh, but not that one. This one. So um, the reason that I want to show this one is the first thing I talked about was what happened in um, my uh, care for uh, uh, my, my thyroid issue and, and getting carts. And I was in CVS about two weeks ago, and they have this um, caring happens when life happens. And there are all of these cards that are inspirational. They're get well. They're all different. And then they have these informational cards for um, like after surgery, for medical conditions, for cancer. And lo and behold, they had one for mental illness. They only have five cards, these five informational cards. And the fact that CVS and um, Hallmark decided to do mental illness, I don't know how. I've never seen anything like it. But when I thought of my talk, and I, I used that, that slide in the beginning of the greeting cards in, in the get well cards, and here it is not a couple months later, I see this in, in, the, um, in the store, I felt very hopeful. And I just wanted to leave everybody with that piece of hope that somebody's, people are doing something and it's not always gonna be the mental health system. It's gonna be people like Hallmark. All right. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I want to thank Karis Myrick and uh, Mary Giliberti uh, for joining us and I think helping us bring this idea of you know, how do we bring the, 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 
the people who are at the center of this in, into the center of it. Um, nothing about us without us uh, is something we hear a lot, and I think that's, that's key. So um, thank you for that. We have eaten into your break a little bit. I hope you will forgive us for that because of the, the compelling nature of the people we have to speak to you. Um, and then just quickly before we go to break, I wanted to let you know that um, there are a couple people out in the audience. If you want to know more about Kaiser Permanente's efforts around mental health and wellness, uh, Cosette Tylak, who is the strategy director for mental health and wellness nationally, and Peter Nixon, uh, who is the senior director at our Care Management Institute supporting mental health and wellness. So find them if you want to learn more about what we're doing. Um, thank you, everybody. We're going to reconvene at 1115.